everyone, happy Thanksgiving, and we are back talking about this wonderful overlap space that we're in in this course. Uh, so those of you who've been following along with uh, culinary innovation at Niagara College, we have spent a few weeks talking about project management and we are transitioning over into doing uh, themes on Six Sigma and Demaic in particular. And there's a bit of overlap here. Now, I, I um, personally am not a person who dwells on definitions and focuses on absolute precision and exactly how things have to be delivered. I prefer to think big system. What we really want to do, whether we're managing projects or whether we are managing existing systems, is we want to be very cognizant about how do we measure our systems and how do we mitigate the amount of error that could be happening within those systems. So if you're managing a project, how do you know that you have completed a task and you have completed it to a certain quality? Well, we measure that. If you are in an existing system that is being run in a steady state, there is no such thing as a steady state. You will find variation within that system. How do we control for that variation? We measure it. And so measuring is absolutely critical for successful systems. Having a process in place is, is required and measuring. So we're going to talk about sources of errors today and at the end of this video you'll be able to define Alpert and Deming's definition for common cause and special cause errors. Ooh, that sounds like a lot of um, vague words but it will make a lot of sense shortly. We're going to describe how the lack of planning methodology contributes to most common cause errors. We'll appreciate how management of systems can minimize common cause errors and we can recognize how special cause errors can be managed and mitigated through appropriate risk management strategy. Well, what does that mean? It means that by having really good processes and having very good systems, we'll be able to minimize the amount of errors that go on and we'll be able to achieve our targets by having less error and we'll have more customer satisfaction. We will be able to complete our projects in more timely fashion and we will have more successful systems. And you know very well that I was going to bring up a quote. And since the topic is quality management systems and measurements, it's going to be from W. Edwards Deming, who is uh, one of the greatest theorists in organizational management and quality systems. His quote here today is, Our system of make and inspect, which applied to making toast, would be expressed, You burn, I'll scrape. And what on earth does he mean by this? Well, he means that if we focus just on the outcome and not on the process and the systems that created that outcome, we're just going to end up with burnt toast. We're going to end up with problems and we're going to end up mitigating problems instead of preventing burnt toast from occurring in the first place. So we're going to have some fun with burnt toast since it's a food science class. So don't just burn toast. What, what he means by this, investigate and measure where problems are occurring. So if we're burning our toast, Somewhere in that system, we know that there's going to be something wrong with the temperature or the speed or the airflow or the conductivity within that system. We need to dig into the problem and resolve it. And ideally, we're anticipating problems before they occur. Hey, it sounds like HACCP, doesn't it? Uh, anticipating problems before they occur. Well, this works for quality management systems as well. So we need to know what the appropriate measurements are, and every system is slightly different. But that said, there are some really useful tools, and, and we are going to be talking about the seven, the seven uh, basic tools of quality measurement, and we're going to be using those because they are really the launching point for almost all quality management systems. What we need to know within those tools, are we measuring the right thing? If I'm making toast, and maybe, I don't know, maybe I work at the Melba Toast Factory. I need to know what color my toast is. I need to be tracking temperature. I need to be tracking the belt speed on my toaster. Um, but if I'm making pizza, I may be using very similar equipment and so I need to track belt speed and, and so on, but my outcomes are gonna be different. You need to be really in tune with what you're making and be realistic about what those outcomes should be in terms of your measurements. 
when we start to make measurements, we can start to quantify and identify which measurements have the biggest impact on quality and profitability. And so we can put our attention on those outcomes first and prioritize our activities. Prioritization is, is only so many hours in the day, so many days in the week, and we need to be able to use our time effectively so that we know that we are focusing on the appropriate constraint. We talked about Ilya who Goldratt's theory of constraints. Using measurement tools here is going to help us identify what's the priority and it's going to help us then focus our attention on that priority and elevate and reduce that constraint so that we can move back on to making good product. So yeah, we've, we've done the PDSA cycle lots and lots and lots, but this is fitting in with that PDSA cycle as well, where we need to think strategically about what's going on. If we're thinking burnt toast, we need to think about what all of those things that could be burning are, what, what's happening there. We need to then make out some sort of tool and we're going to do a check sheet today and then a different video. We can then analyze it and then we can make an action plan. So if, if uh, just in quick summary, let's say we, we have burnt toast coming off the line, we could make a check sheet and start measuring things like belt speed, temperature, um, formulation on the toast and so on. We could then evaluate those check sheets to see which defects are coming up and which problems causing the defect are coming up the most often and then make an action plan. Now, we've luckily had this conversation before, but let me re remind you that when we're doing all of this work, we're in the quality control space and quality control is where we are focused on corrective action and product in particular. We are reacting to it, but quality assurance is the management systems. And so the two of them have to really, really be going hand in hand. So we're detecting defects in the case of all these measurements, but then we need to work in close concert so that we have systems in place to prevent those defects from occurring in the first place. And so I wanted to make sure that we did not gloss over this fact that QA and QC are absolutely intertwined with each other, but QA's responsibility is focusing on the management systems and quality controls is focused on the going out and measuring and being part of the cycle of identifying how do we make the systems better so that we don't have to do as much measuring in the first place. Quality control, it goes back to that burnt toast quote from uh, Deming. Ideally, you're not just out there scraping the burnt crumbs off of your toast. You've got to communicate with the QA team so that the management systems are in place so that, for example, preventive maintenance is done appropriately, equipment calibration is done appropriately, uh, formulation is done appropriately to prevent the toast from burning in the first place. As we mentioned before too, quality control is part of the bigger Venn diagram of quality systems and it has a really important function to play. So back to our errors. Common cause errors do occur. They're natural variations within the system and they are important to know in food systems we do have a lot of common cause error why because we're not just dealing with widgets we're not dealing with screws or automobile doors or um, computer chips in a telephone we are dealing with products that inherently have a lot of natural variation i have bought a lot of carrots recently and no carrot is the same size as the next carrot and I'm sure that the carrots were, that were grown at one farm have a different nutritional quality or a different coloration than the carrots bought at the second farm. Honestly food products have a huge amount of natural variation and we have to be cognizant as food scientists that that is appropriate within many circumstances. Now that said, within your quality system, you could put in product specifications saying, I will only accept carrots that are 10 centimeters to 20 centimeters long, or I will only accept, I don't know, uh, yogurt that has 15% uh, solids, plus or minus 2% for your product to work. You can set specifications 
so that your common cause variation is minimized. But within food systems, it's not like we can be having the same level of precision as you would see within certain other manufacturing systems, such as automotive or electronics. There, because of the nature of the product, you can have much tighter um, quality on the outputs that are being uh, transferred into your system. Special cause variation or special cause errors are these bigger malfunctions and bigger external issues within the system. Now, Deming said that uh, around 94% of error that occurred within systems was caused by common cause, and around 6% was special cause. Um, they, use, uh, they use the example of projects often are late, but are they late because of big, huge things like global pandemics or hurricanes or, or so on? These are special cause errors that are causing delays within the progress of a project. Or if you're thinking about manufacturing, common cause, you could say, my product tends to be slightly off weight specification because I'm making chicken fingers and chicken breasts tend to be variable in their weight. You could say that's common cause error, but you could have, say, uh, for example, you could say my chicken fingers are off weight because we had a calibration malfunction and during the calibration process, our weighing devices were not calibrated properly and therefore we were putting out product that was off weight specification. That malfunction in could be a special cause error. What we need to be aware of is that um, irrespective of whether it's a common cause or special cause error, we need to be out there measuring. And so we are, um, here's a better uh, slide that's summarizing these things, but common cause error being unassignable, the idea is that we know that there's variation that's occurring. Special cause of these sorts of Murphy's Law where there's an assignable cause. What's interesting is within quality systems, they always say that special cause error is more difficult to control, but I disagree. I, I would say that from a risk management perspective, you can anticipate a lot of special cause error. And risk management scenarios allow you to be able to mitigate and minimize the impact of special cause errors. So that's why risk management is part of this continuum. When we had a slideshow just a week or two ago about risk management within food systems. So we do need to think about that measurement piece. I want to know where my shoe heart chart went. I had a shoe heart chart here and somewhere. Let's just escape right out here and I'm going to find the shoe heart chart for you. Oh, ha, ha. there we go. Shoe heart chart. That's where, uh, in this case, this is this is what's called a shoe heart chart. And shoe heart was uh, actually a mentor of W. Edwards Deming, since I like to talk about history of, of systems so that we understand why they were built the way they were. Um, shoe heart was a statistician and he liked to measure errors within systems and the shoe heart chart we will have a full uh, we will have a full session on how to use shoe heart charts but the idea being in general common cause error is typically considered within um, three standard deviations of the mean within that measurement and anything that's outside of that three standard deviations of the mean is considered a special cause error we will have a whole session on using control charts or statistical process control charts or shoe heart charts. As these are all interchangeable terms that are commonly thrown about when using these terms. But the main, the main take home that I want you to have from here is you need to think about what you are making or what, you, what kind of project you are doing and how do you measure that you have done it successfully or you have not done it successfully and using that framework, then what sorts of tools moving in, we're going to move into those tools, what sort of measurements do you want to be making so that you can know if you're in control or not in control? Let's jump back to the PowerPoint slides and I'm not going to, I'm not going to edit this all out. I'm just going to roll with it because I've got other things to do and more videos to make. So main thing is we're starting to measure. That's really, really important. 
If you can measure it, you can manage it. And honestly, that's what we're going to be transitioning towards. So from a project management perspective, how do you measure that something is done and something is done successfully and is done in a way that you are meeting the needs of your customer? So how do you measure completion on whether it's a task or on the full project? Because that measurement piece is really, really critical. How do you know you have met the satisfaction of that project? And in the steady state, again, too, how do you know your process is in control and what sorts of actions or activities you need to do to make sure that your product is high quality and consistently meeting the needs of your customers? So let's leave you with one last quote. As you know, um, W. Edwards Deming was um, working with the, uh, not the Marshall Plan, he was working with General MacArthur in Japan in post-war um, post-World War II Japan, helping rebuild the manufacturing systems. And what was interesting, during this whole period, fascism was very, very prevalent within many of the different global governments. And there was always a fear from communist systems that standardizing systems was going to reduce free speech and reduce freedom of expression. And W. Edwards Deming was very... Uh, very clear that standardization was actually a way of allowing better opportunity for free speech and better opportunity for free expression and better opportunity for building your business because it allowed for systems to interchange from business to business. It allowed for one company to be able to have the same dimensions or the same specifications on typical inputs and that allowed for seamless integration between these different companies to allow for good economic development. And so I'll leave you with one quote. He was he wrote quite extensively about the role of understanding standardization is not a means of limiting people's free expression. Standardization does not mean that we all wear the same color and weave of cloth, eat the standard sandwiches, or live in standard rooms with standard furnishings. Homes of infinite variety of design are built with a few types of bricks and with lumber of standard sizes and with water and heating pipes and fittings of standard dimensions. So all of this work and quality control isn't supposed to be minimizing your creative powers. It's supposed to allow you to know that within your creative powers, you are meeting the quality expectations of your customer time and time again. And so often I have this debate with students saying, I don't want to work in quality control. It's so boring. It's, uh, it's so limiting on, if you are a product developer, you need to be intimately engaged with your quality control team to know what are the sorts of things that they need to measure so that when you are developing that new product, you know that your quality control team is going to be adequately able to say, yep, these are things that we are capable of producing and we can produce them successfully time and time again. Vice versa, many of the students that we work with love quality control because it's very systematic and they like the routine aspect of it. But rest assured, there's a very important creative aspect to quality control. You need to use a lot of those brainstorming and creative thinking process to think about how do you solve the problems that are, are facing the systems that you're working in. Are you really, really digging into the root cause of why those problems are occurring and not just using the tried and true answers that are often in front of you? So there's always that tension between quality and product development teams. And I want to reassure you that that tension should not be there. The two are intertwined and they're absolutely critical for the successful uh, development of food products. So I'll leave you with that. And I've got another slideshow coming up because we're going to introduce those seven tools of quality and we're going to start with check sheets, which is one of the, the nicest, simplest and very, very effective tools that we're going to be using. So take care and watch for a second video coming up right now. Take care.